I want you to imagine for a moment that you're out cleaning your garage or going through an old box and you come across a really important piece of paper. And in that paper, you find out that you have an identity. You find out where you came from. Even more importantly, you find out where you're supposed to be going. You find out who you are. You find out what you have. You find out what your destiny and what your future holds. In that moment, I, I think we all would have a reaction. It would kind of like be, it'd be like discovering that you hold the winning lottery ticket, right? Not that we would encourage anyone here to play the lottery, but let's just say someone were to give you a lottery ticket, right? And, and you find out that you're the winner. When you find certain things, there's a, there's a big reaction. Uh, maybe you've, you've lost something before and you had looked for it and looked for it and looked for it and then you gave up on it. You said, you know what, I guess I'm never going to find it. And then when you least expect it, maybe a year later, all of a sudden, you discover it. What kind of reaction do you have? That's, that's happened to me before. In fact, I heard of a, of a great organization that, that we love and support here as a church called Christ for the Nations. I was just reading in, in, in a, an article they sent the other day that they had a, a piece of property in Jerusalem, Israel. And, uh, but the only problem was... Through several decades ago, when they had purchased it, they lost the title deed to it. And in a very accidental way, just a few months ago, someone was cleaning up an old file box and found the title deed. And, and it's changing completely the future of Christ for the Nations in Israel. They're, they're going to be opening up at a campus there. They're going to be able to train students there just simply because they discovered something. They found something that had been lost. Imagine if that happened to you. Imagine if you found something that could completely change the rest of your life. What would you do? Today I want to speak to you on the subject. What will you do with the scroll. Now, today, as we study God's Word, uh, many of you are, are going to read it from a screen that's been created on a PowerPoint slide that's going to contain God's Word. Many of you are going to be reading the Bible from your phone or from your tablet. Uh, you know, it's funny how sometimes society resists certain changes. It used to be when you walked into a church, uh, every pastor said, can everybody please turn off your phones? Now we encourage you, will you get out your, will you turn on your Bibles, please, right? Get out your phones and, and turn on your, 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 your Bible app. And we're always resistant to certain changes in technology just because we, we, we get used to what we get used to, right? We, we know what we like and we like what we know. Uh, but in the same way that, that now most of us read the Bible in a digital format after having read it in a book format for a long time, remember something for just a second before you get hung up on the methodology that Jesus didn't read the Bible in a book format. He read it from a scroll. He would take a scroll and open it. And that's how people read the word of God. And, and so we've seen this, the, how this has evolved. We, we went through from scrolls to the, 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 the printing press that happened uh, in, in the, the 13 and 1400s in Europe. And then all of a sudden we see the word of God that was available. And it brought on the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. And all these things that, that happened. We're experiencing right now actually a digital revolution of the Bible. More people are engaged with the Bible now than ever before. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Uh, you can open up a free application right now and read the Bible in well over a hundred languages plus multiple versions of the Bible in many of those languages. That's just amazing, and to God be the glory, and it's one more testament to the power that exists in the Word of God. But I want to ask you a question this morning. If we go back kind of old school, before PowerPoints and, and before the Bible on your phone, and before even the Bible in the form of a book that most of us may, might have grown up with, and you go back to the scroll version... What would you do if you discovered the scroll? I don't know if you know this, but one of the reasons we know the Bible is true 
uh, is not just because science has never been able to disprove anything of it, but even as a piece of literature, the Bible stands the test of time. If you ever want to research more about this, you can research, uh, read a book called The Case for Christ. There's also a movie about that. There's also another book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you're kind of into that, because some of y'all are not, you're already tuned out just right now when I just started talking, that's fine. I'm almost done. But some of you guys who want to research a little bit more, uh, check out those books. A Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Uh, a, a, ver- a, a verdict uh, uh, that demands, excuse me, evidence that demands a verdict by Josh McDowell. A uh, tremendous book that lays out not just the, the literary authenticity of the Bible, as well as from archaeology. See, a discovery was made in the 1940s called the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in an area by the Dead Sea. Some, some shepherds, literally modern day shepherds in the 1940s, were taking care of some sheep and some goats and, and one of them went into a, a cave and found an ancient uh, a vase, that, a jar, pottery that was containing parts of the Bible. Once again, reaffirming the authenticity of the Bible. It's just an amazing story. They found a scroll, and it once once more affirmed so many things that we already knew about the authenticity of the Bible. But there's actually several different instances in the Bible, we're not even going to get to all of them today, where the Word of God was rediscovered. And the question becomes, what will you do with the scroll? That is the question. So in 2 Kings 22 verse 8, we're going to read about one of those stories. It says, Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. He found the winning lottery ticket, or even better than that. I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan, and he read it. Now, we find ourselves in the middle of a story of a king named Josiah. Josiah is kind of known as the boy king because he he became king at eight years old. My son is seven. I can't imagine next year him becoming a king. Can you imagine that? Eight years old, he becomes the king. Josiah, though, is known not just because he started his reign at such a young age, but because of what he did and how he reacted when he discovers in the midst of a a construction project that they were doing, they were going to try to clean things up in the temple, they discover something. And I want you to watch one person's reaction to finding the scroll, to finding the word of God. Verse 11, it says, when the king heard what was written in the book of the law, he tore his clothes in despair. Now, that seems kind of weird to us, right? Like in in our modern society that like, you know. I say, hey man, I've got some bad news for you, and I tell you some bad news, and you start kind of shredding your shirt like you're Hulk Hogan or something, right? That, that's, that's kind of what we think of, but that's not what was going on at that time. It was a, it was a sign to say, I, I, am, I am so sorry. I, am, I, am, I have a broken spirit. So in the same way they would have a broken spirit, they would actually begin to tear and break their clothing. As a way of saying, I, 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 I'm desperate. I am, I, am, I am so sorry for what's going on. I'm repenting. For what I have done. And this is the reaction to someone finding the scroll. Verse 13, it says, Go to the temple and speak to the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah. Inquire about the words written in this scroll that has been found, for the Lord's great anger is burning against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words in this scroll. We have not been doing everything it says. We must do. Can everybody say with me, everything? The problem with everything is it's kind of all encompassing. <laughs> it's, it's, kind of a, it, it's kind of a declarative, an absolute statement. And I think actually all of us can relate on this Sunday morning with the way Josiah felt. Because maybe even if they'd been doing a lot of things right, he realized now that I have encountered the word of God, I realized we have not been doing everything that God is telling us to do. And I don't know if just right now the Holy Spirit is beginning to speak to someone in this room because you know that while you may be doing some things right, 
there's some things that God still wants you to do. And this morning, He loves you so much that He brought you to this place because He's a God of grace and mercy. He's a God of second and third and however many opportunities you might need. And He wants to tell you once more, obey my word. It's for your good. It's going to give you a much, much better life than if you just try to do things on your own. We have not been doing everything it says we must do. Then it goes to the next chapter. It doesn't just end there. Uh, This is what I want to point out to you this morning. Josiah doesn't just tear his clothing and say, oh man, we really messed up. He goes on in in, in verse 1 of chapter 23 of 2 Kings. He says, Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. You know why? Because no matter how society has categorized us as important or not important, the word of God is for every single person here. The Bible is not a tool that a pastor uses to give him sermon material to preach to a church on a Sunday. The Bible is for every single person believer. Be very careful when someone kind of tries to reserve the Bible for their own interpretation revelation and and, and tries to kind of create a certain uh, distance from quote unquote normal people and their access to the word of God. That's what brought on such a dark time in the history of the church. Last year, we we studied uh, the, the, the Reformation It was the 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And one of the things we realized where everything started with five phrases from the Latin. The first one was sola scriptura, which means only scripture. That we have to have a love for the word of God. That everything that we do, everything that we justify, everything that we condemn must be based upon the word of God and not one guy's opinion. It's got to be based in the word of God. And so it says all the people from the least to the greatest. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. Now I want you to notice the word entire book. The entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar, and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all His commands, laws, and decrees with all His heart and soul. I want to point out to you two very important things in in, in, in this scripture. I want you to notice that it says, There the king took his place of authority. See, when you understand the word of God, then you understand what your place of authority is. And you know how to take it. It's very difficult to walk in the authority of the name of Jesus if you don't know the words of Jesus. When you know the word of God, it gives you the power to walk in authority. So it says the king took his place of authority. Also notice that he did it in the Lord's presence. There is an incredible combination that happens When we get into God's word, because it ushers in God's presence. Now, we normally associate God's presence with music. And yes, that is one of the incredible tools that God has given us. The experience of praise and worship that takes us into the presence of God. But let me just remind you of something else. There is a divine, supernatural outpouring of the presence of God that comes over our lives as we read the word of God. Now, this morning you might say, you know what, man, you lost me right there. Because sometimes I read the Bible and I just, it just looks like Japanese to me. I have no idea what's going on, man. I don't understand it. We'll get to that. Don't worry about that. I just want you to understand that the Word of God is powerful and it ushers in the presence of God. See, when I understand the Word of God, then all of a sudden my worship, the songs that we sing go beyond just pretty lyrics, they have understanding and power and connectivity to what the Word of God says. And then as I continue to worship, then what I've experienced and felt in His presence, then the next time I open up my Bible, I'll say, oh yeah, I remember that emotion I felt as I started worshiping the King of Kings, and now I'm reading His words. And then I start to read His words, and that ushers me back into His presence. And then when I'm in His presence, then I long for His words. And then I start reading
reading his words and I just want to abide and dwell under the shadow of the almighty God and be in his presence. There is a correlation. You know, last week we talked about a radical balance and I just want to tell you, you don't have to be a worship guy or a word guy. You don't have to be a person that loves just, oh, I just, I just wish we, every service, all we did was sing. And then you got the other people, I, I, mean, I don't know why we have to sing one song. I think we should just start with a Bible study right from the beginning, right when we walk in. As a matter of fact, we should start at about seven in the morning. We should go about four hours, Pastor Tim. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You need the word of God and you need the presence of God. They go hand in hand. Most things in the Word of God, God has created a beautiful marriage in these things. Worship and prayer go together. The Word and prayer go together. Prayer and worship, all these things are interconnected. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing that God does. Don't isolate them into silos. These are all related things. One inspires the other and then feeds the other. Worship, prayer, the Word, all of it. Goes hand in hand. Just wanted to point that out. You could easily just gloss right over that. But understand that you take your place of authority and you do it in the presence of God when the word of God is being read. It says, in this way he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll and all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. When we hear the word of God... It forces us to decide what we're going to do with it. And the best thing we can do with it is say, yes, God. I renew my covenant to you today. I know I told you last week. I know I told you five years ago. But I say to you again today, God, I'm all in. Everything you say, God, I'm willing and I'm desirous of it. Yes, God. So what will you do with the scroll? I pray that each and every one of us would have the same reaction that Josiah did. That he said, you know what, I, we, we've got we've to do something with what we just heard. See, it's one thing to feel bad when you read the Word of God or you hear the Word of God and go, yeah, man, I'm, I'm just not doing good there. And God, I'm really sorry. And then just keep on doing the same old, same old. If you go back to that chapter 23 in 2 Kings, you will find... A huge list of all the things that Josiah did. He didn't just, it wasn't just an emotional moment on Sunday morning. He said, oh, I feel God. God, you know I'm sorry. Please forgive me. He went out after that. And he said, you know what? We need to take that down. That, that altar over there, we need to destroy that. This false god that's been being worshipped, we've got to stop that now. And he starts cleaning everything up. See, our problem is we think we have to get everything cleaned up and then we can come to God. No, you come to God and you let his word start to wash over you. And guess what happens? Change, reform, transformation, renewal, freedom. You get set free because you come to know the son of God. And when you come to know him, he will set you free. What will you do with the scroll? Then we see this other story. It's, it's, it's a story that you could easily gloss over in your Bible reading. It comes from the book of Jeremiah. And it's this other king, a descendant of Josiah, that has a very different reaction to what to do with the scroll. They discover, as the scripture says here, it was in a winter time, in the autumn time of the year there, that they, they have this discovery, hey, we were cleaning some stuff up, we were going through some old files, and we've discovered the Word of God. They refer to it as the Book of the Law. We've discovered it. And so they, they come to the king. They say, we've we got to go tell the king. He, he's going to want to know that we've discovered the Word of God. So now we've got to do something with it. So they come and, and they present it to the king. And they start to read it to him. And this is his reaction to what to do with the scroll. In Jeremiah 36, 22, it says, It was late autumn, and the king was in a winterized part of the palace, sitting in front of a fire to keep warm. Why don't you just kind of begin to paint a little picture. You got your little king guy, right? Got a little crown. He's sitting down in a chair by the fireplace because he's cold. 
In fact, if you ever, some, some of y'all that, that understand furniture and, and know that there's something called a wingback chair, right? It's got, got these little sides on it, right? Well, you can kind of rest your head, but that's not the purpose for it. I don't know if you ever knew this, but up until about 400 years ago, or maybe even recent, more recently than that, uh, well, actually way more recently than that, people would warm themselves by a fire. But back in, in, in the 15 and 1600s, people had a stigma in Europe about bathing. They'd never wanted to bathe. Now, nobody make a joke right now about how they still don't. But anyway, they didn't want to bathe. And so, and so they, the ladies would put on one layer of makeup after the other, never washing it off. It, it, it would build up to actually where it's begin to change the formation of their face. It just was one layer after the other. Ladies, you know how it is. Sometimes when we're really tired at night, you don't want to get out your makeup off and all that. Well, they, they just kind of did that for like several years, okay? They're just taking it on, one layer after the other. The problem would be is, if they didn't have one of those kind of chairs that had the little things on the sides, they'd get cold in the winter and they'd start sitting next to the fireplace. And someone would go, um, hey, by the way, half of your face is falling down, right? Because it would start, the, the makeup would start to melt because of the heat of the fire and half their face would start to go down. So I imagine this king sitting in this big chair, kind of protected from his face from the fire, but warming himself because he was cold. And there was this guy that was bothering him. In this case, in this story, this is not so much of, of an ancient law that had, been, that had been found like we see with Josiah. But in this case, the word of God speaks through a prophet named Jeremiah and he writes it on a scroll. This is the word of God. This is a message for you, king. And so he goes, okay, this God of yours, he's got something to say to me. I'll listen. So he's sitting there in late autumn in the, the warmed part of the palace, sitting in front of the fire to keep warm. And each time Jehudai finished reading three or four columns, the king took a knife, and cut off that section of the scroll. He then threw it into the fire, section by section, until the whole scroll was burned up. Does that mess with you like it messes with me? You know why it messes with me when I read that? Because I asked myself the question, are there some sections of the Word of God that I'm burning in the fire? That I don't really want to hear that right now. You ever, you ever gone to someone with a report and you start telling them and they say, you know what, I don't want to hear that right now. And so we just, you know, kind of block it out. Well, the Word of God was speaking through the prophet Jeremiah and the king didn't want to hear any of it. And so he just started Cutting out a section at a time. Now, I doubt anybody here has ever burned a Bible. I pray you haven't. It's the sacred word of God. I, I doubt you even have ever, like, ripped out a page from a Bible and said, you know what, I don't like this part of the Bible. <laughs> Wad it up, throw it in the trash can. I, don't, I, I, would, I would imagine no one here in this room has done that. But how many times have we read a section and said, later... Not right now, God. I don't want to hear that. It's when it gets very real in our lives. And the question is, what are you going to do with the scroll? It goes on to say in verse 24, Neither the king nor his attendants showed any signs of fear or repentance at what they heard. What will you do with the scroll? The contrast could not be greater between the way one king named Josiah reacted and then this other king, his descendant, just decided to start destroying section by section of the word of God. One was so repentant. And he didn't just stop with repentance. It turned into action. See, to repent 
is to say, I'm going to take a, a, a 180 degree turn. Sometimes we get confused and say, that person did a 360. You don't want to do a 360. Let me just help you out real quick. Uh, geometry wasn't my, my strong part in, 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 in high school. But let me just remind you something. Don't ever say, yeah, man, I'm just going to need to do a 360. Really change things. 360 is uh, go right back here. Now, maybe for a dance move, that's kind of cool. But what you want to do is a 180, okay? That means I was going this direction, and I realize I'm wrong. And so I say, God, I'm sorry. So now I turn and I go the opposite way of the way that I was going. That's what Josiah did. He allowed the word of God to bring conviction to his heart. And then it didn't just end in an emotion. It translated into action. He made a change. He did something differently. Because of what the word of God was speaking to him. What will you do with the scroll? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture, everyone say with me, all. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. And to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, and I've seen some of you already already taking notes or taking pictures of of these slides and and jotting things down, you're going to want to notice something. I'm going to try to help you out visually today, breaking down this verse. Because you can read the verse like this. And this is actually something I want to encourage you with in your Bible reading. Is any time you see multiple things listed, pay attention to that. So I hope visually this is going to help you today. But we're going to, this, this can help you not just with the scripture, but with your daily Bible reading. When you read God's word, to really let it sink in. Really think about what you're reading. Not just read it so you can check something off on your list. But read it so that you can understand and say, God, is there something you want to speak to me today through your word? So let's look at this. We're going to break down this verse phrase by phrase. We know that it's talking about scripture, that all scripture is inspired by God. So it's inspired by God to do what? To teach us what is true. What is truth? Who has the authority to determine what is true and what is not? See, there's, there's something called absolute truth. And there are people who will try to argue with you philosophically and say, there is no such thing as absolute truth. And they just fell into their own trap because they just declared an absolute truth in their mind that there is no absolute truth. See if you can kind of... Some of y'all about this afternoon about 4 o'clock and go, oh, I get it. Yeah, I know what he was saying. And I'll, I'll say it one more time. There are people who are going to make a declarative statement to you and say, no, you can't tell me the word of God is truth. There is no absolute truth. And so what they have just declared is an absolute truth. Their belief that there is no absolute truth. And so what we have to understand is there is such a thing as absolute truth. So then who determines it? Who is the person who can, or or, or what is the thing that can therefore declare, this is absolute truth? I have the answer for you. The Word of God. It is the truth. I'm going to have to get ahead of myself here for just a second to understand the correlation between the Word of God and Jesus Christ. Because they're one and the same. And we know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. And the life. So the Bible teaches us. The word of God explains to us. What is the truth. It's to teach us what is true. So that, that's your first thing you have to understand. Secondly. It's to make us realize what is wrong. In our lives. Now that's. Where it hits home. See it's one thing to talk about something that's truth. But then when that truth starts to mess with you. When it starts to mess With me, with us. And we say, wait a minute, there's some stuff in that's wrong in my life? How dare you? I'm perfect. Now, guess what? I got a news bulletin for you this morning. Please don't hate me. 
there might be a thing or two in our lives that are not perfect. In fact, they may be kind of wrong. We may be doing some stuff wrong. There may be a better way than the way we think we should do something. So the Word of God, it's to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Now it is that juncture right there that marks the difference between one reaction of repentance and another reaction of rejection of the Word of God. Because if there's pride in our heart, then we say, uh, uh-uh, uh-uh, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm never going to read the Bible, but I'm just not going to read that part again, or I'm not going to allow that part to make any change in my life, because it's saying that I'm doing something wrong, and I don't want to hear that. That's where rebellion creeps in. That's where our heart has to be soft and say, God, please forgive me if I'm doing some things wrong. There's some things in my life, God, that I want to open up to you, and I want to say, I'm sorry. I realize I'm doing it incorrectly. Let's go on here. What's the next thing it says? It says, it corrects us when we are wrong. Now, did you notice the the other phrase there is, we realize what is wrong. A lot of us get to that point. In fact, you could could get into a bad rut of getting to that point every Sunday. You know, I realize what I'm doing is wrong. Next Sunday, so hey, what'd you change? Oh, nothing. I just remember feeling really bad last week because I realized what I was doing was wrong. (laughs) Hello. That's where the rubber meets the road. Then it goes on to say, then it corrects us when we are wrong. Again, let's use the analogy. I'm going the wrong way. Hey, you're going the wrong way. Right? So then in that moment, I have to correct that. If I know I'm going the wrong way, and that way is a way of danger for me, then only someone who wants to self-inflict pain on themselves will continue to go in the wrong way. This has happened to me. I I remember sitting at a a, a traffic light uh, last year, and they were doing some construction on on a road up here by Carrollton in the colony, and, and they had all the lanes of traffic all changed with barrels and all kinds of stuff. And it was super confusing. And I drive that route like, like almost every day. And I was like halfway confused. Well, imagine you've never driven that area. I saw this poor lady turn and start going in a one lane direction the wrong way. And of course, everybody just started honking. First, because people were scared. Then second, because people were mad. You know, she was going to cause a big traffic jam. But imagine that you realize you're going the wrong way, and then you just keep going. No, no, no. What do you have to do? What this lady had to do. You have to put it in reverse, and you got to turn it around, and you got to start going again in the correct direction. So the Word of God teaches what's true. It helps us realize what we're doing wrong in our lives, and then it corrects us when we are wrong. So see, it's, it's one thing to realize, hey, I'm doing it wrong. Okay, now I want to correct that, though. I want to stop doing the wrong thing. Let's go on. What's the next thing it says? It, says it teaches us to do what is right. So I realize I'm going to. I realize I'm going the wrong way. I'm going to stop going the wrong way, and now I'm going to start going the right way. This is what the Word of God does. It teaches us to do what is right. And then finally, it says that the Word of God helps us to prepare and equip. Do you know that? No matter what comes our way, no matter what comes our way, you talk about an absolute statement, no matter what comes our way, the Bible can prepare us for it. Oh, well, how can you say that, man? I mean, and you right now you're imagining the worst thing that could ever happen to you. The Bible can prepare you for that. It can prepare you for how to deal with it. If it's one of those things that, that like Paul prayed, I, I, I asked God to remove the storm from my flesh... And he chose not to, and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Or it can prepare you to how to avoid that catastrophe. Or it can prepare you to how to fight against the enemy when you're facing that attack. No matter what the situation is. We talked a few weeks ago about the weeds of a new season. There are some things that are because the enemy did it. The Word of God can prepare you how to fight against that. There are some things that are circumstances of life. The Word of God can prepare you with how to deal with that. And then it equips us. I love that. It gives you the tools that you need 
to overcome. Everything that we need, we can find in the Word of God. It equips us. It makes us stronger. It shows us the right way. It gives us the tools that we need to get the job done. This is what the Word of God does. All right, so... We talked about some ancient stuff here. We're, we're talking about a scroll. I mean, does anybody have any scrolls at their house? Unless you bought it probably as like a souvenir somewhere. I doubt anybody like reads a scroll every morning, you know? And no one gets like the Wall Street Journal in scroll format, right? You know, that, that's, that's just like not very common to our lives. But what about the like day-to-day stuff that you and I face? Issues with relationships. Issues with finances. Issues with health. All these different things. Let me just tell you something. The Word of God prepares us and equips us. The Word of God speaks to every area of our life. Question is, are we going to allow it to speak to every area of our life? David was a man after God's own heart, not because he was perfect, but because of his response to God's Word. David was a famous king, probably the most famous king, and then his son Solomon. And then we see like this whole big other list of kings, like some of the kings we mentioned at the beginning of this sermon today. But until Jesus came and, 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 and they cried, he is the king of kings, and, 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 and blessed is, is he who comes in the name of the Lord, until that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, there was probably no greater king than David. This is a man that the Bible says had a heart after God. So, David must have been perfect. No. No, we, we see a lot of mistakes. David had an extremely dysfunctional family. You may have heard of one of his sons named Absalom that rebelled. It wasn't just Absalom. David's, David's children dealt with incest, with trying to, to do a political coup. There were so many things dysfunctional about David's family. David himself committed adultery. And then... He killed the husband of the lady with which he'd had adultery. And this is the great king of Israel? This is the one that the Bible says he had a... He was a man uh, after God's own heart? How can this be? It wasn't because he was perfect. But it's because of his response to God's word. You see, just like Jeremiah brought... A word of prophecy and warning. This happened as well when David was king. After he had sinned, prophetically, Nathan came to him and he confronted him. One of the most beautiful prayers you will ever read in all the Bible is in Psalm 51. And it's David's prayer of repentance. See, it's just a matter of how are we going to respond to God's word. And when you start to read the Bible, you go, man, I... I don't think I'm doing this right. There's some things I'm doing wrong. And you could get like all underneath condemnation and go, man, I'm just horrible. Just remember David. Just remember Josiah. Don't just stay in an emotion of condemnation. Allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to cause change in your life. God doesn't point out what we're doing wrong because he wants to hit us over the head with the whack-a-mole mentality. If if that's your mentality of God, that he's playing a big whack-a-mole with all the earth, with all seven billion of us, right, on the face of the earth right now, and every time we do something wrong, bam! And God goes, yeah, ten points. No. (laughs) That's not the way God's thinking right now. Remember, he's not the whack-a-mole God. He is the father of the prodigal with arms open wide. No hammer in his hand. In fact, just the opposite. Arms open wide with a ring and with a robe preparing a feast. Some foe to chow like you've never had before in your whole life. That is the heart of our father. David understood that. David didn't try to claim he was perfect. As a matter of fact, only the Bible would be so truthful as to expose all the greatest weaknesses in all of the heroes of the Bible. Jesus, of course, didn't have any weaknesses. He did never sinned. He was, he was perfect. He's the Son of God. Blameless, spotless Lamb. But every other great hero in the Bible, we see their flaws. And yet they're listed in Hebrews 11 as the heroes of the faith. And we can point out 
well, Samson, I mean, Samson did this and Samson did that. David did this, David did that. Solomon ended up doing this, Solomon did that. But yet, the Bible calls them the heroes of the faith. And you know what makes the difference? It's not their perfection, because none of them were perfect. And none of us are perfect in this room. It is simply the response to the Word of God. What will you do with the scroll? How will you react when you discover it and it discovers you? Some of the psalmists said it this way. Psalm 119 verse 103 says, How sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. I heard that little Jewish children, when they are reading from the Old Testament, that sometimes parents will put a little dab of honey on the page of the scripture. So their children will associate something sweet and yummy as they read the word of God. To teach them the word of God, it's delicious. It's awesome. It's sweet. It, it, it's, it's like dessert. It, it, is, it is something I love. I can't wait. I mean, you know, my, my son, his, he, he has two qualifications of where he wants to eat. If we ever talk about, hey, I think we're going to go out to, out to eat as a family. He wants to know two things. Number one, do they have steak? He discovered steak last year. He, he, he was still five, about to turn six. And, and he thought he'd died and gone to heaven. He's like, steak? Where has this been my whole life, right? Why have, you, why have you as parents been shielding me from steak? This is awesome, right? And so he just loves it. He's a little carnivore. That's question number one. Question number two is, do they have chocolate cake? Right? Because he absolutely loves chocolate cake. What if we understood that the word of God was the meat that makes us strong? That protein that we need to build muscle spiritually. And yet, God doesn't stop there. He says, you want to finish off with some chocolate cake? Because the Word of God challenges us, it strengthens us, it makes us healthy. And yet, at the same time, the same Word of God is delicious. We love it. Make sure you don't ignore one section. Make sure you're not like that king that says, well, I like this parts of the Bible, but I don't like these parts. Make sure you're not sitting there cutting it off. Then it says in verse 105, it says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. If you feel like you're stumbling around right now, you don't know what the next step is, and like you're just walking in darkness, I've got news for you. The Word of God is available to you today, and it is a lamp and a light and can show you the way. What will you do with the scroll? Will you just hide it and stay in the darkness? Or will you let it turn on the light into your soul and into your heart and say, God, examine me. You know, whenever I go to the, to the dentist or to the doctor... I've never been in one, one, one dentist office or doctor's office when they're doing an exam where they say, we're going to turn off all the lights. In fact, it'd be kind of weird. I'd kind of like get up and leave at that point, right? But anyway, <laughs> I just had to say what everyone's thinking, right? But as a matter of fact, have you ever been to the dentist, you know, and you got like four things, they've already put it in your mouth. And they're like, so how you doing? You're like, I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. Trying to talk, you're like, why are you asking me these questions? Do you not know that I can either not respond or secondly, I'm going to drool everywhere when I do. But anyway, what do they do? They take a big light and they shine it. Because when something needs to get fixed, you don't keep it in the darkness. You allow the light to shine on it. So what if instead of hiding from the word of God, we say, God, examine me. Shine the light of your word on my heart. Shine it on my thoughts and on my words and on my actions and everything that I'm doing and everything that I'm thinking and everything that I'm saying, God, I want your light to shine upon me because I want to do what you've called me to do. And I want to walk in the fullness and the health that you've called me to walk in. Don't hide from it. Don't keep it in the darkness. Verse 162 says, I rejoice in your word like one 
who discovers a great treasure. I found it. What I've been looking for all this time, all the answers that I was looking for, I just discovered them. I found this great treasure. You know, there are people that spend their entire life looking for lost treasure. That's not just in the movies. There are literal people who do that right now. That are out there in the Atlantic Ocean looking for ships that went down 400 years ago. That they believe have some huge treasure on it. Imagine when one of those guys finds something like that. Oh man. What would their reaction be? What if when we discover the word of God. That's our reaction. sweeter than honey it's a light it's a treasure see remember something Jesus is the word of God this is what the Bible tells us in John 1 14 it says so the word became flesh he became human and made his home among us he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness and we have seen his glory the glory of the father's one and only son the word became flesh so the word of god what breathed and inspired through the holy spirit words be written down that we read now as our bible that word it became flesh his name is Jesus. He's the truth. He's the way. He's the life. He's the light. He's the bread of life. He's the living water. This is Jesus. The Word of God made flesh, dwelt amongst us. It was for this reason that our good old friend Peter, in John 6 68, says, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. There's no other place we can go to. When everything feels like it's caving in, when you realize that the things of this earth are, are very temporal and they're very shallow, and the happiness that they bring is just for a few fleeting moments. And you want to find something on which you can build your life. Let me just remind you of the words of Jesus. Because he said that anybody who listens to his words and then obeys. Notice that combination. Is like someone who builds their house upon the rock. So when the storm comes. When life comes at you from every direction, you say, it's okay, because I know where I'll go. I'm not going to go to TV. I'm not going to go to a magazine. I'm not going to go to a friend. I'm going to go to Jesus, because he has the words that I need. And when you start to read his words, his presence starts to wash over you. And his presence starts to wash over you. Then you begin to remember some of those words that you thought you'd forgotten. But you heard a preacher say one time, maybe a Sunday school teacher taught them to you when you were a little kid. And all of a sudden, they take on a whole new meaning because you realize that the word of God is alive and is speaking to you right now for the things that you are going through right now in this moment. And the word of God becomes alive inside of you. Where else can you go to get that? Nowhere. Only to Jesus. So what will you do with the scroll? See, I, I, could, I could have spent the last 40 minutes showing you different Bible plans, giving you a, 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 a lesson as a teacher, as a professor, on, on how to read the Bible how to do a, a bunch of things and, and, and how to understand the different sections of the, of, of the Bible. And we'll do that because I think it's important that you start to learn. 
But I'm not going to exp- start off with the what, and I'm not even going to explain to you so much today the how. I'm going to explain to you today the why. Because when you accept the scroll into your life, the words of God, and you don't just feel bad, but you allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit that leads you to repentance to also bring change into your life, this is going to bring new life. It's going to bring abundant life. And it's going to bring eternal life. It's way more important to me today that you understand the why. See, if, if, if in any way we've, we've moved into that, that motivation of the why, the word of God, trust me, just Google, there's a lot of ways you can find out the how for a Bible reading plan. It's never been easier than it is today. What we need to remember this morning is the why. That'll motivate you more than just checking something off of a list and in a box. Because you remember the word of God is alive. So what will you do with the scroll? You know, it's hard to react to something, to know how to make changes in your life of words you've never read. So I I hope if nothing else has happened today, there is all of a sudden a renewed awakening and hunger to read the Word of God. To study the Word of God. To memorize the Word of God. To allow the Word of God to bring change to your life. What will you do with it? But before you get to a Bible reading plan or anything else, you've heard the Word of God already today. It's one of the great things about us getting together, worshiping God and reading His Word and studying His Word. Because right now in this moment, there's an opportunity to respond to the scroll. In this moment, you'll make a decision if you'll be like Josiah and David. Say, God, I embrace your word even when it hurts. Or you'll make the decision to reject, ignore, bury, burn, hide the word of God. I believe I'm looking at a group of people today that fully embraces the word of God. They realize that his word is alive, that his word is the truth, that his word is the way. Would you close your eyes right now? Holy Spirit, come over us right now. Breathe upon us right now. God, we are willing. We humble ourselves. We humble ourselves right now, God, and we say we want more of you. We want to rediscover your word, God. Lord, if some of my friends in this room today have grown distant from your word, they don't remember the last time that they consistently we're reading the Bible I ask God that a hunger and a renewal will start to happen right now in this moment but God I know that even right now there are some things that we can identify in our lives that we know don't line up with the word of God so today God we want to repent we realize we're going the wrong way and we don't want to keep going the wrong way so God we say I'm sorry that I'm going the wrong way. And then we turn and we embrace your move. We embrace, God, your plan. We embrace your way. And we say, yes, God. I believe that there is a holy moment of repentance that can happen right now in this room. God's spirit is moving and breathing right now. I don't want to abort anything that God is doing. So if right now you just feel like saying, God, I'm sorry, because you know in your heart that there are some things you're ignoring from his word, could you just begin to say that to him right now? You don't have to shout it, but you can go ahead and open up your mouth and just begin to say, God, I'm sorry. God, I I ask forgiveness. Change me. Renew me. And maybe you're not quite sure, actually, some in this room may not be actually quite sure. 
And you just right now need to allow the word of God to shine that light and reveal if anything is wrong. Could you just embrace that right now? Just say, God, speak to me right now. Show me your way, God. I long for your words, God. I long for your words right now. God, as a church, we cry out right now and we say, God, we want your word to be alive in us because your word has power. And we take our place of authority right now according to the word of God. And God, if we have not walked in that authority, we say we're sorry, God. And we're going to begin to declare your word in Jesus' name. We declare your word right now over our lives. We declare your word right now, God, over our families. We declare your word right now over this city, God, in Jesus' name. We declare your word, God, over our future and over our destiny in Jesus' name. God, we begin to declare your word right now. Would you stand to your feet right now and just begin to declare the word of God. To begin to declare his promises over your life and over your family. God, we declare your word right now. We declare your word is alive inside of us. We declare, God, that you are speaking. Word of God, speak in this place right now. Pour out your spirit, God. Pour out your words over our life. God, we hunger for you. We long for you, God. Like a deer that pants for the water, God. We need the living streams. So speak to us right now, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. He's speaking. He is rekindling a fire inside of someone right now to go after the word of God like you've never gone after it. To realize that it is sweeter than honey. To realize that it is a lamp and it is a light. To realize that it is like a found treasure. Thank you, God, for revival in your word that we're going to experience as a church. We thank you for it, God. With every eye closed, I want to ask today if there's someone in this room that realizes that you're far from God and you know that you're going the wrong way. The Bible tells us to repent, to be baptized and then to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And today I want to invite you to that first step right now and that is to repent. And then soon as a church, we're going to celebrate baptisms together. And I know God is going to do a baptism over your life and you're going to become renewed and you're going to become filled with power like never before. But right now I want to ask you a question. I want, I want to, to invite you. If Jesus isn't the Lord of all, if he isn't your Lord, if you know you're going the wrong way and you want his word to come alive inside of you, we've all been there. Some of us made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of our life when we were younger. But no matter how old you are today, you can make that decision. 
So with every eye closed, if today you want to ask God to forgive you of your sins, you want to know that you have the promise of eternal life, that when you die, you don't have to be afraid to know that you're going to go to heaven because your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life, to know that God is going to welcome you in to the heaven that he's prepared for you. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand? We're not going to ask you to go into a different room. We're not going to ask you to come forward. But I am going to invite you to repeat a prayer after me. So if that's you today, would you just lift your hand and keep it raised right now? You don't have to raise your hand. I just invite you to do it because it's a declarative moment to say, this was the day that Jesus became the Lord of my life. I see several people with their hands raised today. We thank God for what he's doing right now in this room. And so we ask that God would would do something just supernatural right now. Let's repeat this prayer together. Say, Heavenly Father, please forgive me of all of my sins. Wash over me with the blood of Jesus. Renew me and make me whole. In Jesus' name, I repent and I turn from going the wrong way. I will follow you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank God for what he just did right now. Let's sing one more time. Christ alone. Christ alone. Can we worship him right now? If you just rededicated your life to God or you just gave your life to him for the first time, you can declare these words. There's power in these words. Through 